Hi, everybody. John Michael here. Welcome to H2OMG. Actually, hey, Jillian. Um, that's not how I do it. I normally oh. am not that peppy. Um, okay. So if you could tone it down tone a little it bit. Down. Okay. And also, I say, I say, hi, everyone. John Michael here. So oh, it's not okay. everybody. It's okay. not everybody. Yeah. Okay, oh, okay. So let's try that again. All right. Well, all right. Here we go. Hi, everyone. John Michael here. I say hi. Oh, sorry. I say hey. You, hey oh, you say, say hey. Yeah, I'm no. sorry. Okay. No. I'm just going to mess let's, this up every time. Let's try it from the start. <clears throat> okay. We're going to get this right. Hi, everyone. John Michael here. You did it again. Oh, what? I did what? You said hi. Which, I say hey. Oh, you say hey. <laughs> hey, everyone. John Michael here. Today we have Dr. Robert Mace. He is the interim direct, executive director and the chief water policy officer of the Meadows Center for Water and the Environment and a professor of practice in the Department of Ge- Geography at Texas State University. Can, can I just say, you're doing great because you're stumbling. You right. sound exactly like me because right. you're stumbling okay. over well, everything. This is perfect. I wasn't sure, um, but you know, thank, I'll, I'll do my best to try, and, this. to try and be you. Well, but, thank you for yes. doing this because, you know, my throat's a little bit sore. Right. And so I appreciate it. I don't think anyone will even notice that it's you doing it instead of me because you're doing such a my good voice. job now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they, might, they might catch on, but... So Robert has over 30 years of experience in hydrology, hydrogeology, stakeholder processes, and water policy. Robert has a Bachelor of Science in Geophysics and a Master of Science in hydro- Hydrology from the New Mexico Institute of Mining and Technology and a PhD in Hydrogeology from the University of Texas at Austin. Lots of big words there. So Yeah, a lot of, <laughs> a lot of hydro words. Yeah. So, and then I normally say, uh, something like, all right, let's get to the show. All right, let's get to the show. <laughs> let's try, try that one more time. It was too, try uh, that one more time. Sorry, too, too excited. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll be a little Just bit more. Be, yeah. um, okay, all right. One, two, three. Oh, okay, now go. Action. All right, let's get to the show. Perfect. Is that? <laughs> <laughs> I literally. Robert. Hi, Robert. This is Jillian North with the City of Fort Worth. How are you? I'm doing well. Good. Sorry for the troubles this morning. No, no, no problem. Um, mm. So I am going to go ahead and go over your um, bio, which thank you for providing them. We were actually um, laughing at your humor, um, which is kind of well known, <laughs> I feel like, um, throughout the industry to begin with. So um, I'm going to go ahead and um, let everyone know that Um, We are speaking with Robert Mace. He is the Interim Executive Director and Chief Water Policy Officer of the Meadows Center for Water and the Environment and a Professor of Practice in the Department of Geography at Texas State University. Robert has over 30 years of experience in hydrology, um, hydrogeology, stakeholder processes, and water policy. Robert has a BS in geophysics, and an MS in hydrogeology from the New New Mexico Institute of Mining and Technology and a PhD in hydrogeology from the University of Texas at Austin. So thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. And, um, you know, we are huge fans. Um, I think the first time that I heard you speak, um, it was at a groundwater to the Gulf workshop. And, um, let me tell you, everyone was laughing, um, at your presentation, not at it, but with, I think your presentation, (laughs) there were so many, um, an important distinction. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. I want to make that distinction, but, um, we were just, it it was just so fun to hear you speak. So, um, I want to thank you for, um, on behalf of everyone that was at the groundwater to the Gulf, um, summit that, you know, um, we were happy to have you speak there. Well, thank you. That's very kind. Yeah. But I really don't think that there is another person who has been almost as instrumental as you uh, to, um, you know, the industry. You have um, you have been involved in everything from water conservation, groundwater modeling, uh, groundwater management, environmental flows, desalination, floods, what causes drought. Um, you have kind of, uh, you know, you have definitely impacted the water industry. So um, we're really, really happy to have you. But also, 
um, you you are interested in blogs as well, right? You blog. I, I, yes. It's, ah. it's an affliction. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, so you really, really love uh, deep dives into Texas water, it seems, um, especially when it comes to groundwater and aquifers. Um, can you talk a little bit about what intrigues you about Texas water and what inspired you to get into water in the first place? Well, what, what intrigues me about Texas water is it's just so interesting and multifaceted and there's great stories. There's drama. Mm -hmm. There's cool things that Texans are doing. There's opportunities for Texas to do better. Uh, there's just so much potential and so much work and so many fascinating aspects to it that uh, it's just, it's been a, a great career for me to, to be in Texas and working with, with Texans to help solve our water problem. Mm -hmm. And, terms, and you started out kind of from a geology standpoint, right? I, I did. Um, you know, in terms of what inspired to get me in the water, uh, it's, a, it's a story of, of oil, dirty dishes and big hair. <laughs> uh, Can you explain that a little bit more? So, so when I was uh, in high school, um, I had various interests, but I was particularly good in math and very much interested in geology. And so um, my mom, as moms often are, uh, was helpful in pointing out that, you know, hey, math and geology, geophysics, and holy cow, look how much geophysicists make in the oil industry. <laughs> yeah. And, and so I was like, okay, well, that sounds good. Right, right. And so off. To New Mexico Institute of Mining Technology, I went, and my family didn't have much money, so I was always writing for scholarships and grants. And mm -hmm. I wrote one that was a general one, and it asked the question about what my chosen profession was going to do to make the world a better place. Mm -hmm. no, nothing against folks who find oil and gas for a living, right. but but uh, it rang hollow to me. I wrote right. some good stuff. I wrote some good stuff, but it, it rang hollow. Mm -hmm. So that kind of got me to thinking that, you know, well, maybe oil and gas isn't where I want to go. Mm -hmm. uh, meanwhile, I was uh, um, a work-study student doing dishes, and I went to New Mexico Tech because of the potential of working in laboratories and getting real experience. But here I was doing dishes in the cafeteria. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I was a goth kid. <laughs> <laughs> so I, had, I think like, we can identify hair. with that, yeah. <laughs> I had crazy hair, you know, which makes it – difficult getting a good job are we talking like uh but, like robert smith type hair exactly okay. like gotcha. down to the eyeliner <laughs> i was in i was in a band i was in a goth band too wow and uh oh can i so, ask what uh, the name of the band was <laughs> it's was called uh, echolalia nice oh, okay. nice that's great <laughs> that's perfect um and then there was another one i was in called memento mori remember death oh, but anyway wow. <laughs> nice. we digress you were legit yep <laughs> So, uh, so one of my co-dishwasher workers pointed out that there was a graduate student in the hydrology department that also had crazy hair and that I needed to find out um, who her advisor was and see if, I, if he had a job. And so I did exactly that. And lo and behold, he had a job and, and he hired me. And, uh, and honestly, goodness, that is how I got into hydrogeology. Wow. And once I was in, I was like, these are good people. Um, these are good, fun topics. There's a lot of variety. And, uh, and I was hooked at that point. Yeah. Yeah. I can, that's understandable. So, um, you know, I think one of the interesting things, um, about Texas is that, you know, there's a lot of, um, people who have visited Texas. There's, um, you know, it, it seems to be kind of like, you know, people expect it to be all cowboys and deserts, but it actually has an abundance of water, you know, and we all rely on water, obviously. Um, but early American settlers were not the first to recognize the abundance of water in Texas. Native American tribes, Spanish priests, you know, other visitors and residents mm -hmm. of Texas relied on kind of pre-industrial resources. And what do you think makes Texas water unique? I think, I think Texas makes Texas water unique mm -hmm. and yeah. by, by that I mean the the range of, of climate and the range of geography so one side of the state 
um, we're swimming in mosquitoes with more than 60 inches of rain per year on average, Mm -hmm. um, you know, on the east side of Houston. And then on the west side over by El Paso, we're looking at six to eight inches of rain. Mm -hmm. And then there's the, uh, you know, we have have the mountains in West Texas. We've got the the plains of the Ogallala. Uh, We've got this varied geology. We've got the Edwards Aquifer where water just gushes out of it. Um, we've got these um, artesian um, deep aquifers along the Gulf Coast. Um, it's just uh, it's it's pretty amazing. We also have our kind of unique um, legal history and management history with mm-hmm. water mm-hmm. Um, that's uh, somewhat unique to other states in terms of how we manage surface water and groundwater and how we don't recognize the connection between the two. Mm-hmm. Um, I think also, um, you know, Texas has a lot of water, but we also have a lot of challenges. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, most of the water is on the eastern part of the state, and and most of our water challenges are on the western part of the state. And so we've had to be innovative when it comes to water. So there's a lot of amazing things that Texans have done. Um, and then, you know, a lot of times when people think of Texas, they think of oil, but I always like to point to a quote James Mishner, the novelist, said that water, not oil, is the lifeblood of Texas. And mm-hmm. that, that's what connects us today to those Spanish priests and mm-hmm. those Native American tribes that go back so long ago. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right, yeah. Um, pre- prior to me be- coming to um, the city of Fort Worth, I, um, I worked for a groundwater conservation district. And um, that was kind of my first job right out of college, um, my first legitimate job. And, you know, here in Fort Worth, we don't necessarily rely on um, groundwater. You know, it's mostly surface water here in Fort Worth. But just west of here, um, where I live in Parker County, um, we had a few years ago, I think it was, you know, they had the most wells drilled in the state, you know, and so people still do rely on water wells. Um, Now, they're not necessarily like windmills, um, that technology has um, significantly changed over time. Um, and I was wondering if you can discuss a little bit about, um, you know, the importance of technology and the need for innovation when it comes um, to water in Texas. Well, as you know, we only have so much water. Mm-hmm. And so innovation and technology allows us to do so much more with that water. You know, and as you noted, Texas is growing so fast. And, and so goes our, our need for water. Um, you know, it's like Dallas, Fort Worth area, um, less than 1% of the water comes from groundwater. Mm-hmm. But as you noted, uh, on the outskirts of Dallas, Fort Worth, mm-hmm. um, groundwater is the entry drug to development. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, that, you know, it's a distributed supply. It's r- relatively inexpensive to get. Mm-hmm. Um, and then as, as areas become more urbanized, you see them switch over to surface water mm-hmm. because the carrying capacity of the aquifers there you know, can't handle all of that growth. Mm-hmm. That pattern repeats over and over. And we see that in San Antonio. We see that in San Marcos. We see that in Austin. And we see that in Houston as well. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of, of technology, um, you know, the Texas uh, is a leader in direct potable reuse. Um, there's, we're a leader in conserving water, and both in, in urban settings and agriculture settings. Um, Texas is uh, I'm getting much more involved in something called One Water, where, mm-hmm. where we look at urban environments uh, as sources of water. So mm-hmm. like the mm-hmm. air conditioning unit um, is a... Uh, a condenser and it's, it's condensing moisture mm-hmm. out of the air and, and that turns into a potential supply of water maybe for flushing toilets or for irrigating. Rainwater harvesting is one that's been around for a long time. But even wastewater, um, there's a, a, a permitting facility that the city of Austin is building that has a building scale on-site wastewater treatment plant to treat, treat their wastewater you know, that was going down the toilet Wow! Yeah. Um, cool. and other drains to bring it back in the flush toilets, flush mm-hmm. urinals and mm-hmm. used for onsite irrigation. Yeah. Um, and then, and then Austin 
also looking at something that's deliciously named sewer mining, <laughs> um, <laughs> where, where uh, you know, you intercept sewer kind of flowing down the sewer line and treat it and then take that treated water and, and use it for some, some purpose. Mm-hmm. Um, and so technology is, is key in all of this, just making sure that water is, is treated appropriately and safely. That's amazing. Yeah. We have, you know, here in Fort Worth, you know, really engineered rivers and, you know, these large reservoirs um, that really didn't exist at one point. Um, How do you think that the landscape of water has changed over time? Are they good changes? Are they bad changes? Um, Are they kind of Switzerland? Are they in the middle somewhere? You know, neither good nor bad. Um, So, so as a scientist, I try not to be normative. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Um, Also try not to be normal. And, and, and normative mm-hmm. uh, roughly just means kind of being judgmental about right, right. Um, the policies type thing. So, mm-hmm. so my view is is uh, neither good nor bad. Right. Um, it you know really depends on the the mores and morals of the time, and then of course those change with time. Mm-hmm. And back 50, 60 years ago, it was building dams. Mm-hmm. Um, it was. Um, you know, drilling wells and mm-hmm. not a lot of concern about springs and mm-hmm. over time, uh, and also not a whole lot of concern about conserving water. In fact, back in the uh, 1940s and 50s and before that, when, when you said water conservation, what you meant was keeping the rivers of Texas flowing to the Gulf of Mexico. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, but that, that word has changed over time. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, and, and as it should, because you know, we have different values today than that our, our fathers, mothers, or grandparents had back back in their time. Mm-hmm. Um, having said that, you know, one, one thing that uh, I see over and over again is that when you do anything with water, make sure you look for the unintended consequences. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, so, you know, reservoirs have uh, allowed Texas to meet water needs for decades. Um um, but they do have environmental consequences as well as taking people's lands mm-hmm. through right. eminent domain. Mm-hmm. You know, the Ogallala Aquifer is the breadbasket of the United States, mm-hmm. but we're slowly draining that aquifer dry. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, you know, more recently, there's a greater focus on water conservation and using wastewater for water supplies, um, which are all good things because they preserve our aquifers and waters in the river. Um, but um, it has impacts on downstream water users and the environment because it's less water being returned to the river. Mm-hmm. Um, right. So it's like any, any anytime you push um, on the water picture, you know, it's bulging out somewhere else. It's having some sort of impact. Mm-hmm. So on that note, is is there a favorite feature of yours in that in regards to Texas water? I know that you um, have a number of postcards, I think, um, that I saw in one of your presentations at one point um, of artesian wells, um, and, and you seemed pretty, um, you know, interested in that feature. But is there any other, um, you know, favorites that you have in the Texas landscape? Yeah, I was, I was uh, as an aside, I was telling my class last week about um, – how I collect uh, water postcards in Texas, yes, and uh, yeah. you know, and they looked at me like I was a little crazy. And, yeah, <laughs> and, uh, and they're like, "Why do you, Why do you do that?" And I'm like, "Well, if I ever find myself single again, I'm kind of <laughs> hoping this will bring the ladies out." You know? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it's a long term investment. Um, <laughs> I it's, it's a hard question to ask in terms of what's my favorite. I know but, it. But I guess yeah. I have to. Yeah, I have to say that uh, today I'll go with uh, what. What's right outside my office window, which is which is San Marcos Spring. Oh yeah, um, it's a, one of the major springs yeah. that issue from the Edwards Aquifer, and it's, it's really area. amazing. It's mm-hmm. literally a river that comes out of the ground, yeah, and forms the headwaters of San Marcos River. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. Can I just ask you, Jillian, what's your favorite feature? Yeah, so um, it's funny because having grown up in Parker County, I didn't have a lot of access to caves and whatnot, but um, I think that there is a um, cave system near San Antonio where um, I, we took a tour of it one time, um, I think in one of these groundwater to the Gulf training courses, and it was just 
I, I don't know if you can call caves a water feature, but they really, I mean, they really, they really are. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, the cave system um, it, outside of San Antonio was probably my favorite. Okay. Yeah. I was going to say caves. Yeah. You, can, you can definitely call it a water feature. Um, yeah. yeah. It was created, created by water. Yeah, right. And it's, it's a cave system I'm thinking of. I uh, know you saw water down in there. You were looking at groundwater. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So I think, um, you know, we get to communicate just kind of in, I mean, in what we do every day um, with many different people about the importance of water. And I know that this is kind of a vague question, but um, since, you know, you have this, you know, two decade, you know, long, you know, uh, run at the Texas Water Development Board, um, you've had, a, a, you know, the ability to talk to so many people about water. Um, what do you think is the most important or most impactful thing that people can learn about water? Um, I think, uh, I think maybe the most important thing is that, uh, you know, every time you, you turn on your faucet, you become part of water's story. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of folks take water for granted and in a large part because water suppliers have done such an awesome job of providing reliable, clean water to people. And so a lot of times we just don't, don't think about it. Mm -hmm. um, but, but that water, when you turn on that faucet, you know, it, it started somewhere with rain that fell on someone's land. Mm -hmm. And depending where your water comes from, you know, that water ran into a river and flowed down a river uh, or it trickled into an aquifer and then was captured maybe by a dam, or maybe by, by a, a city's pump, uh, treated to meet your needs, went through this amazing pipe infrastructure to you. Mm -hmm. You use it. And then the story doesn't end because then that water goes somewhere. Mm -hmm. You put it on your lawn. Maybe it's recharging the aquifer. It's evaporating. Um, it's being carried away from you. It's wastewater. Maybe someone's sewer mining it. Um, more likely it's being, being treated and perhaps it's being used on the local parks with purple pipe. Or it's going back into the river, um, meeting someone else's needs. You know, supplying water for wildlife and then ultimately to the bay and estuary and back to the ocean. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think it's important for people to realize that, you know, you're, you're using this resource that is on this big cycle. Um, and, uh, and I would argue it's important to know where's your water coming from mm -hmm. and then also where's your water going mm -hmm. and then thinking about how are you using that water? That's great. This is kind of an aside, but um, do you happen to follow the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District on Twitter? <laughs> I do not. Very specific. <laughs> you should. Sounds like I should. <laughs> you really should because they are hilarious. And just yesterday they tweeted, um, I don't remember the exact quote, but I think it was every faucet has a past, every flush has a future. And I thought <laughs> that was really great. great. They're, That's funny. They're, um, we're big fans of theirs. They're really, yes. they're really funny. And yeah, they're very interactive. Yeah. yeah. So I would definitely recommend yeah. following them. <laughs> Who's that again? Northwest? Um, Northeast mm -hmm. Ohio Regional Sewer District. I think they're at, right. at Neo RSD on Twitter. That's funny. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, as you mentioned, um, we know that there's, you know, in addition to a repercussion for our water use um, up above the ground, we also know that there's life under the ground. Um, you know, there at Barton Spring, you know, there's salamanders. I think in one aquifer in Texas, there's catfish. There's other life forms that are obviously present in aquifers and were kind of previously unknown to us. Um, but what significant changes have you seen or discoveries you've made since you began your journey in the water world? Is there Anything that stands out to you as kind of the most spectacular? Um, well, first on the kind of the life underground, I was actually last week at a um, um, invertebrate in groundwater conference where we're talking about bugs and things that are in cool. uh, yeah. various, like the Edwards Aquifer and the limestones of the Trinity Aquifer, particularly in central Texas. And the Edwards Aquifer is, is one of, if not the most, biologically diverse mm -hmm. groundwater ecological 
happened in the world. Mm-hmm. There's a, uh, and it's and it's and it's kind of crazy because there are wells that are over a mile deep, mm-hmm. and if you put a net on on what's coming out of that well, you'll capture blind catfish. That's amazing down there. Yeah, um, just just really incredible. Mm-hmm. But but in terms of uh, you know significant change or discovery I've seen um, since uh, uh, I began my journey in, in water, um, I would I would have to call it direct potable reuse. And mm-hmm. Seeing that mm-hmm. implemented in Texas, yeah, and uh, and direct potable reuse is like we, we talked a little bit earlier about wastewater. Mm-hmm. Well, you can take that wastewater and treat it back to drinking water quality mm-hmm. and put it put it back into the drinking water system mm-hmm. um, and direct usually means there's a it's a pipe to pipe so there's no um, buffer mm-hmm. um, versus indirect so like Dallas Fort Worth there's uh, I think I read 500 million gallons per day of mm-hmm. wastewater discharge right. to the Trinity River right um, that flows down to Houston and uh, in normal times provides about Fifty uh, percent of uh, Houston's supply that yeah. treated wastewater. It's amazing. Um, but but direct is more hardcore because you're like you're going you're, you're treating it and you're putting it back in. And right. Texas right. was the second place in the world to do this out um, with a plant in Big Spring mm-hmm. as part of the Colorado River Municipal Water District's water supply system. Mm-hmm. Um, second in the world. The first one was in Namibia, Africa. Wow. And I did. I never thought I would see direct potable reuse in my career. Yeah. Um, and that's an indication of Texas ingenuity, um, how Texans value water, particularly in West Texas. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's been a, a very successful project. Since then, there was an emergency project in Wichita Falls during that last terrible drought right, yeah. we experienced. And then um, um, El Paso is building a direct potable reuse plant now for their water supplies and you can imagine they have all kinds of of uh, concerns and have to work hard to make sure that they're resilient on water and in the state water plan there's two to three dozen communities planning on doing direct potable reuse Mm -hmm. Um, so that's that's been the most amazing thing that i've seen yeah that's a a big feat you know in getting people to make that leap you know from um, you know, considering it as this, you know, um, kind of discharge that they don't want anything else to do with, you know, to get that changed right. in the minds of Texans is, is pretty amazing. Yeah, it is. Mm-hmm. So um, my last question, um, you know, there are many different avenues that people can take and none of them would exist without water. We, uh, you know, wouldn't be able to thrive as we do in Texas without the individuals behind the scenes. So uh, where do you see the most need career wise um, for the water industry? Um, do you think we need more engineers, more communicators, more operators um, and why? Um, yes. Yes. And yes. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> I figured it was all of the above. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a, yeah, there's, there's a real need for, um, for folks and job opportunities for folks and, for, you know, engineering, mm-hmm. communicators, operators, uh, water resource specialists, hydrogeologists, hydrologists. Um, it's and it's a challenge. Um, there are communities um, struggling to find people to operate their water and mm-hmm. wastewater plants. Mm-hmm. Right. Struggling to find engineers. Um, struggling to find like I I struggle to find hydrogeologists with groundwater modeling. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a real opportunity for for people to get into these these careers. Um, yeah. There, uh, you know, I've had people. I mentioned earlier, I looked at the oil and gas industry, and I got my geophysics degree, and then applied it to water. But my mm-hmm. uh, geophysics friends would make fun of me for not getting into oil because you can make <laughs> so much more in oil. Right. I'm like, well, right. Yeah. The oil goes up and down. I think yeah. if we average things out, we're about the same. Right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't but I don't have all the drama y'all have. Right. <laughs> right. Water exactly. Shock. I mean Exactly. You know, yeah. We're always gonna need water. Right. Yeah. So yeah. there's stability there. Mm-hmm. And then you mentioned earlier in my career I had I touched on a bunch of different things. Um, and water touches on bunches of different things. And mm-hmm. so 
you can you can use it with uh, any other interest you have. And it's been a fantastic career for me. It's, there's always things changing, mm-hmm. keeping it interesting, keeping it fascinating. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so I encourage your listeners. Uh, you know, yes, um, this, this is a great career to get into, and there's definitely a need. Yeah, I agree. I think we, I think, uh, we like what we do here, um, at the city of Fort Worth, but, um, thank you for sharing your experience with us and, um, all of your insight and your humor. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, <laughs> My pleasure. I want to be respectful of your time. So, um, you know, we can, um, and unless there's anything else you, um, have to add. I was wondering, say it, but... oh, go ahead. <laughs> sorry, I was wondering if, um, if you have a social media that you want to give a shout out to, if yeah. you want people to find you on social yeah. media or, or, or um, give a shout out to your blog. Sure. So, so I'm on, on uh, Twitter at Mace at Meadows and my last name is spelled M A C E. Um, I have a blog. You have water mail. <laughs> and if you, if you Google that, you can, uh, you'll find that blog. Mm-hmm. I also have a blog on, uh, um, groundwater called so secret occult and conceal mm-hmm. um which uh no i'm not a devil worshiper uh, <laughs> that, well it sounds like one those, of your um one of your <laughs> bands back in the yeah day. you're Band right covers, <laughs> your song covers yeah maybe that maybe that's why i got in the water <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but those are infamous words in mm-hmm. the texas supreme court in 1904 that established rule of rule of capture in texas mm-hmm. right. so at that blog i i try to post about about groundwater things Great. All right. Thank you so much for yeah, doing Yeah. Thank you so much for your time. Sure thing. My pleasure. Wish you all the best. Thank you. You too. Bye. Bye. Bye bye. Sorry. Oh. I was so nervous. You were nervous, really? You're way better at this than I am. Oh, for some reason, uh, I just got really nervous. That's funny. I, I couldn't tell. Okay. Good. You weren't saying um or anything like well, I do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> um, yeah.